We're going to return to the psalm. You might turn to the 43rd psalm. I call it a third refrain. You might look in our songbook sometime, and if you're looking at the words and the verses, there's verses, and, and at the end of the songbook, there's a, I mean, at the end of the song, a lot of times there's a chorus, you know, and it repeats the chorus. Sometimes it's called a chorus. Sometimes it's called a refrain. This is the refrain. I looked that up one time and, and knew the difference, but they're so similar. I've kind of forgotten what that distinction was. There's a technical difference in a chorus and a refrain. Look for things like that when you study the Psalms. The Psalms are songs. And, and there's, a, there's poetry to them. And this 43rd Psalm sits in the book of Psalms like a third verse. A third refrain is there. Now, most of these Psalms, you can study them on their own. It's like this Psalm, and it's independent of all the other 149 Psalms that are there. This Psalm just stands alone, and then the next one does. But, but some of them are grouped. There's a relationship between some of them. You kind of have to watch for that to, to see that when you read the psalm. But here, between the 42nd and the 43rd, there's some kind of connection here. Look in your Bible at the 42nd psalm. Go ahead and open it up and look, and you'll see there's an inscription. Now, those are the, those are the words just before the psalm begins. They're usually, in the King James Version, they're usually in a little smaller print. All of the... Psalms do not have an inscription, but the 42nd does. And it talks about the sons of Korah in that inscription. There's not an inscription for the 43rd, but for the next six Psalms, look at them. The next six Psalms have an inscription for the sons of Korah. That's... That's eight. There's four other psalms in the book of Psalms. Further on down, there'll be four others that are for the sons of Korah. If, if you count the 43rd among them, that's 12 psalms for the sons of Korah. If you, if you leave the 43rd out, it's 11. You know, 12 is a number often found repeated in Scripture. 12, 12, 12, 12. Seems like there ought to be 12 of them instead of 11. We'll count the 43rd. And then something else about this, and that refrain. I call it the third refrain. Look at Psalm 42.5. I don't know if you'll remember when we went over this a couple of months ago, but there's a refrain in that psalm. Look at verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And then it continues. Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the health of his countenance. Now you go down to the end, verse 11. You have the refrain. There it is again. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who's the health of my countenance and my God. Now, Go to the 43rd Psalm and look at the last verse. Look what it says. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who's the health of my countenance and my God. You see that refrain three times with the third ones in the next Psalm. How do you explain that? How, how come? Well, now, some have said, well, maybe they were all one psalm at one time and somehow they got separated. Well, maybe. And, and it seems to me like maybe it's like some of the songs in our book. They have the verses and someone comes along and says, I know a good third verse for that or I know one more extra verse for that. And if you look in the book, sometimes it's noted that someone else wrote that last verse. And that's what it looks like maybe for this psalm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write, maybe David wrote the 42nd psalm, and then later the Holy Spirit said, I want you to write one more verse. You write one more verse. And call that, that'll be the 43rd psalm, because it fits that, a third refrain. Now, the other thing about it is, is the content of the psalm. 
Let me remind you of the 43rd, 42nd Psalm. For my heart panteth after thee like the heart panteth for the brooks. The, the, the 43rd Psalm at first verse, David's in a dry and thirsty land. And he's missing the company of the saints when they gather together for worship. He's with a bunch of people that don't care about God and he's missing that company. And then you go down to the, to the sixth verse and now he's in a rain-soaked, cold, drenched lamb as the storms go over him and he's missing that company. And they're ridiculing him. Where is your God? And, and they're making fun of David. When I, in the 43rd Psalm, we get the same kind of thing. David is longing to return to Jerusalem where he can worship God and he's got enemies about him. In the 42nd Psalm, it's this. They continually say to me, where is thy God? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me. While they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Have you ever been with people like that? I mean, you're religious. You're, you're devout. You're, you know, you're not going to make it this weekend. Cause that, that'll run into Sunday and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be at church on Sunday. And, and Wednesday night, that, well, Wednesday night's church night for us. And people ridicule for putting the Lord first like that. Because they're not like that, and they don't like you being that way. Well, that's kind of the way company David's in. But the 42nd, 43rd Psalm, 43rd Psalm, he starts talking about those enemies again. And look at the kind of enemies David has. They are ungodly. They are deceitful. And they are unjust. You can know a man by their friends, can't you? Think you'd know them by their enemies? If you have enemies, I hope you have the right kind of enemies. Enemies that are ungodly because you're godly. Enemies that are deceitful because you're honest. Your enemies are unjust because you try to be fair. You try to be just. You try to be righteous. Hope you have the right kind of enemies. Don't expect to be a Christian without having some kind of enemy. There's people that just don't like what's right, and they don't like people trying to stand for what's right. Luke 6 and verse 26, Woe unto you if all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets, the false prophets. You want anybody to speak well? Just say anything. Say what they want to hear. When you tell them the truth, they may not think so much of you. Look, 1 John 3 and verse 13, John wrote, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. And James 4, 4, Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You don't want God to be your enemy and you don't want to be, God, you don't want to be God's enemy. Well, don't be a friend of the world then. Now this isn't talking about nature. It's not just talking about people. It's talking about this, this culture, this worldly, materialistic, self-centered, ungodly culture. That, that's not the kind of friends you want. Are they your enemies? Well, maybe that is speaking something well of you. If those are the kind of enemies you have, here's how David confronts this. God's my judge. And he's asking for God. He's asking for his judge to plead his cause. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause. I tell you, if your advocate is also your judge, you're in pretty good shape, aren't you? Just let the Lord judge and he'll, he'll plead my cause. He knows what I'm facing. He knows what I'm going through. Romans 8, 31 through 34. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, and rather is risen again. Who 
He's at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us. How does that compare with those that would judge you? God's your judge. Psalm 118 in verse 6. The Lord is my side. I'll not fear what man can do to me. So, so evil men don't like you, do they? That should not intimidate you. What you need to think of, where is my standing with God? If I'm in good standing with God, well, these evil men can think whatever evil they want of me. That's, that's going to be, God will judge them. And we got to keep God in our focus. And so he prays, deliver me. I'm reminded of how the Lord taught us how to pray. Deliver us from evil. I think one of the translations that I consulted says, deliver us from evil men. Deliver us from those that would do evil to us. That's what we can pray. Deliver us from evil. And then we can have the confidence, you see, as we face this evil world. So thou art the God of my strength. You, you know why Christians can be so strong in the midst of adversity? And can still continue to have the strength <laughs> to love their enemies when their enemies are being hateful toward them. Where do they get that strength? It's not from within themselves. It comes from God. See, they know they understand how God thinks. They know what God's done. They have God in all their thoughts. And they know God's a judge. And that gives a, that gives a Christian strength from what they know about God. God is the source of my strength. And so David asked the question then, why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? It's like, this, this just doesn't, it doesn't seem like it ought to be this way, God. Why, why are you casting me off? And God does not cast us off. If we're trying to do what's right and we're facing opposition, it, God doesn't abandon us, but you know, it might seem like it. It might feel like He's abandoned us. Now, He has not done that. We read in the New Testament about men ought to pray everywhere lifting holy hands and it says without Wrath or doubting. What are we talking about there? Well, um, I've, sometime I've been in an assembly and I've been sitting in the pew and there's people all around me and they've called on me to lead, the, lead a prayer. And usually, you know, you get up in front of people and leave, but I couldn't get out, out of the pew. I tell you what I did. I just, I just lifted up my hand to say the prayer. I was a prayer, and that let everyone know where the prayer was coming from. And that's why a man is to lift up his hands when he's praying. He's leading the prayer. It's not literally lifting them up. A lot of times we do it by standing up in front of people, but lifting up the hand. You know, but then what does he mean without wrath or doubting? It's because he's talking about public prayers. If you're full of wrath and you're struggling with doubts, Take it to the Lord in prayer. But go to your closet to do that. When you're leading the church in prayer, that's not the time for you to talk about your personal wrath and your the, the wrath you're dealing with or the personal doubt. Now, there's a time to do that. That's in your closet. Remember, you're leading everyone else in prayer. When you, so lead the kind of appropriate prayers. What does he say to pray for? Pray for kings and all that are in authority. We may live a peaceful life. Those are appropriate things for public prayer. But David here is saying, why'd you cast me off? Why go out mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? David's in his closet praying this. You want to lead a public prayer? Don't do that. But in private prayer, if you've got wrath, if you have doubts, if you have personal struggles, if you have things to confess, 
that no one else knows about, take it to the Lord in prayer. Go to your closet. Pray it in your closet. That's what those closets are for in prayers. But now, it doesn't say, God has not abandoned us. When it feels like it, when it seems like it, know that it is not so. He hasn't done that. How's David going to find his way? The next verse, Psalm 43 and verse 3. Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. David's been in the dry and thirsty land. He's been in the rain-soaked land. Now he feels like he's in the darkness. But I'm going to get out of this. And I'm going to let his light and truth Lead me. Psalm 109, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How do you know how to get through this old world? I tell you, we've got, we got our flashlight right here. Okay? Look to the light. The light of God's word. God's truth. It will lead you right through these, these dark times that you struggle with in your life. You have guidance. Now, don't wait until you get in the darkness and then try to go around and find the light. Go ahead and learn it. Come, come, to, come to Sunday school. Come to worship. Come on Wednesday night Bible class. And go take special studies. Make Bible study part of your habits. Learn this book. Then when the darkness comes, you know where the light is. You'll know where to walk. You'll know where to go. The light of God's truth will lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. And so let thy light guide me. Now Psalm 43, and I put part of 3 and 4 together here, where he says, Let them bring me to thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go to the altar of God. I want you to look at those words. The holy hill. The holy hill. What's up on the holy hill? The tabernacle. It's where you're going to worship. Where, what's in the tabernacle? The altar. You see the progression there? David's going to go right up to the altar where you were. That's where the sacrifice is made, there at the altar. Let this light, let this light bring me home. Take me to the holy hill, to the tabernacle, to the altar. The book of Hebrews says we have an altar. Altars where the sacrifice is made. As I thought on these things, I thought of that, what we call the hill. It's the place, but it's the hill of Calvary where Christ is crucified. But when you're, when you're struggling, remember how our Lord, what He went through. Go to the cross. Stand before Jesus while He's on that cross. Tell Him how hard this is. And He would listen to you from there. We sing those songs, kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. I cherish the old rugged cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. The holy hill, the tabernacle, the altar. Look at the next word. The sacrifice. Sacrifice. Well, it talks about the sacrifice there. But now, Psalm 40, 42 and verse 3. Going back to the earlier psalm, toward the beginning of this, David's in tears. Look what he says. Now, I'm going to the earlier psalm, not 43, 42 in verse 3. My tears have been my meat night and day while they continually say to me, where is thy God? Continue. I mean, they're on to David and they're not getting off of him. They continue in this. It's brought him to tears. Now go to Psalm 43 and verse 4. On the third verse, look where he's come to. Unto God my exceeding joy. He's gone from tears to exceeding joy. Ask some of these, if you're young, ask some of these older Christians about that. You know what they can tell you? 
They can explain to you how you can have exceeding joy even in a time of tears where great sorrow and great joy are mingled together. And so David's in tears. His enemies have brought him to tears. But he remembers God in the midst of those tears. He retains exceeding joy. I'm okay. <laughs> You're out in the parking lot. I just dropped the mic. Okay, so I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> All right, and, and, then, and then look at this next verse. I think this is important. It's important because so many don't understand this. That old covenant, that old worship, I tell you, you had to offer the blood of animals. I'm, aren't you glad we don't worship that way this morning? I'm glad we're not up here slaughtering goats and sheep and making a... Uh, uh, Patsy, how would you like to clean up all that every week? I mean, if we had to go through that and then clean the building after we've done that, it'd be a mess. It was a very materially minded, but these were shadows of things to come. And the new covenant... The new covenant we're under puts away those, those things and brings us to those spiritual things. So under that old, old way that David was trying to worship, he says this, Yea, upon the heart will I praise thee, O my God. In Ephesians 5, 19, under the new covenant, here's what we read, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You see the difference in the harp? And the heart? Let me help you understand this, how beautiful this is. A little heart, it'd be a little bigger than this book. That's not why the book was here, but this will serve. Think and, and here's how you here's how you hold a harp. You know, if you when you learn how to play an instrument, they seem like the first lesson. They always tell you how to hold it. You know, here's how you hold the instrument. You know, here's how you hold the harp. Put it right up here on your chest, right there by your heart, and you pluck the strings of the instrument. Sing and make melody with the harp. No, the heart. The harp is gone. It's the heart. That's the new covenant. That's why the, the new covenant is more spiritual than the old. And so we lay the harp aside. And we focus on the heart here in our worship. And so now here we go to the refrain. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? I thought of this hymn. You've, you've probably heard this one before. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and longing for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion? My constant friend is he, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. A lot of that in spirit, a lot of that's captured by this, this very psalm. Why am I cast down? Why should we be when we have our God, and yet we will be sometime, but we can remember our God. And then, hope thou in God. I shall yet praise him who's the health of my countenance in my God. My God. That's how I am. My God. In this little psalm, I want you to understand who God, who, who David's God is. Going back to verse 1 and working through the psalm, God is David's judge and advocate and deliverer and strength and guide and joy and hope and the health of his countenance. You can, you can see it in the face. The, the, there's, a, there's a beauty in the face of a believer. The very face expresses the serenity that comes. We have God in our hearts. And in those hard times, the very way we face those difficult times can bring glory to God. Because that's where our strength comes. 
for those things. Well, that's the end there to that psalm. I tell you, when I read things like that, when I read those psalms and I think of those spiritual blessings, I'm reminded of how Ephesians 1 and verse 3 says our spiritual blessings are in Christ. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And it makes me want to be a Christian. I need those blessings. I need this in my life. It makes me long for him and to be a Christian. If you're not a Christian this morning, we're going to sing an invitation song. And you're invited to come partake of this great feast that we enjoy as we stand and sing.